Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew Denieri, Resident Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, and thank you all for joining us for this special report launch event, um, All the Autocrats Men, the Court Politics of Putin's Inner Circle. This is the second report in the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center's new Russia Tomorrow series, which seeks to reevaluate um, our conceptions of Russia today and prepare for its future tomorrow. And I'm delighted to have the author of this new report, uh, Mikhail Zigar, here with us. Um, his, his paper is called All the Autocrats Men, uh, The Court Politics of Putin's Inner Circle, just like the event title. Uh, we have exactly one hour today, so here's how we're going to spend it. Um, I'm going to pass the floor off in just a second here to Mikhail to present the report. We're going to do uh, some moderated Q&A with uh, a really good panel of, of distinguished experts, and then we'll do audience Q&A from all of you uh, watching at home. Um, to submit your questions for the moderated uh, Q&A, um, and, and for the audience Q&A, I should say, um, submit your questions to askac.org. That's askac.org, and I'll pick uh, the best of your questions and pitch them to our panelists. And with that, Mikhail, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, that's a privilege for me to uh, be the part of this event and to, uh, to have the opportunity to show my my expertise and my um, an analysis about what's what's happening in Russia. Um, I will uh, briefly highlight the, the most important points of the report. Uh, obviously, I was writing it uh, well before the presidential, the so-called presidential election uh, or re-election of, of Vladimir Putin, but still it was clear that uh, there is a potential for, for some changes in Russia after the, the presidential election. So, so we, we're still expecting for those changes after uh, his inauguration, but uh, we, we, we can still, um, um try to start uh the analysis of those potential changes so probably the the first question uh we we have to address uh, um and we, we have to pay attention uh, who could be the, the the new prime minister that's uh uh one of the most um widespread topics uh for discussions in uh, in in moscow right now if putin uh, is going to fire his uh, prime minister mikhail mishustin or not um because obviously, uh, Mikhail Mishustin is considered to be a um, very effective bureaucrat, um, but it, but he he was really relevant for uh, the, the period of time when he was uh, appointed to that position, which was 2020. Um, he he doesn't show any ambitions. He, he's got a reputation of uh, an effective manager uh, who, can, who can deal with the economy. But... Um, he doesn't suit this uh, exact pol political situation because uh, the tense uh, is rising in uh, in Russia today, and uh, the same propaganda calls the current situation a holy war against the West or the class of civil uh, the clash of civilizations. So, um, for this kind of Russia, uh, which is waging a holy war against the West, uh, Mishustin is obviously not not suitable. Uh, he's a bit too uh, liberal. So. Um, uh, there is a lot of speculations about uh, potential um, uh, candidates for for his re replacement. Although we know that, uh, according to Putin's uh, old traditions, uh, he always chooses a person uh, whom uh, no one names among the, the contenders to be the the new prime minister. But uh, but still, it's it's very important because uh, prime minister in Russia is a potential successor. Uh, yes, Putin Putin wants no one to. Um, to have any kind of sus suspicion about uh, potential succession, but uh, but still uh, there are s several con contenders. Um, Minister of Ag Agriculture Dmitry Patrushev is uh, is usually named as a uh, uh, possible candidate. Uh, I don't think that that he he's the uh, the likely one because he um, he is can he could be considered too powerful if if appointed a prime minister because he's a son of. Uh, um, former head of FSB Nikolai Patrushev, and that would be um, too dangerous for for Putin to appoint uh, such a person as a prime minister. Uh, there is another very important intrigue um, if um, Sergei Kirienko, 
the most important political player in the country uh, is going to be re replaced or not. Uh, he is uh, the first deputy head of presidential administration, and he, he is exactly the person who was in charge uh, of all the domestic politics in Russia during the, um, the last years, and he was responsible for this presidential election. Um, so uh, his, his work, obviously, um, should, should be considered very successful because uh, um, Putin uh, uh, got the same result as, as he was expecting. But still, a variety of sources in Moscow uh, say that, that Kirienka uh, could be replaced after, after this presidential election. And that would mean the beginning of the new political era in Russia. Uh, mostly because uh, it was Kirienka who uh, who selected uh, all the governors in Russia, uh, in, in all Russian regions. And actually, during the recent years, he has raised, uh, he, he has raised the new generation of uh, regional officials, uh, obviously all Russian uh, bureaucratic uh, elite. And most uh, representatives of uh, that bureaucratic elite uh, are... Mm, you know, they, they look uh, um, as if they were clones of uh, Mr. Kriyanka. They are um, same faceless and seemingly ambitious um, um, bureaucrats. But uh, still, it means that um, he, he's considered to be too, um, too powerful for, for this um, situation because he, he has his uh, huge army behind him. Um, that's obviously his um, his weakest um, point, but at the same time, his his uh, um, his advantage is that he still uh, got very powerful patron. That's Vladimir Putin's closest friend, Yuri Kovalchuk, probably the only real oligarch in the country. It was Kovalchuk who lobbied Kirienko uh, to be appointed for for that uh, position as cur uh, curator of domestic policy uh, six year, um, eight years ago. Um, but um, probably the, the, the most important argument why why Kirienka might be replaced is that uh, we hear a lot um, of Putin uh, talking that uh, veterans of uh, so-called special military operation um, have to be the new political elite. Um, and obviously we see a lot of um, signs of uh, real radicalization in Russian society and in, in Russian political elite. So, so new people, more radical, more aggressive with, with war background. So people from, from the war, the party of war, uh, they are expected to be more visible after, after this uh, presidential election, while uh, the, the new government or the, the, the new presidential administration is going to be, uh, to be appointed. Um, I would also uh, like to, to highlight that uh, there is a new trend, which is uh, the increased influence of the Russian Orthodox Church and uh, uh, its head, Pet Petra Kirill, who used to be considered uh, just um, a minor um, head of uh, corrupted state corporation. But now he he's much more in the influential. He, uh, he looks like uh, a member of Putin's new Politburo. And um, uh, the church is is needed much more by uh, by Putin's ideology because uh, it plays very important role in popularizing the far right rhetorics. Uh, we have the, the the new campaign to, to ban abortions. We have we we used to see the the, the huge uh, new campaign uh, against LGBT and so on. So uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's obvious that that Kremlin believes that. Um, those uh, far-right values are very popular in the West, and uh, um, they they want to promote them to get more supporters uh, in the global South, in Europe, and in the United States as well. Um, another important um, uh, character in in that um, Kremlin's landscape is a former president, once a liberal, uh, uh, once considered to be Putin's uh, potential. Uh, rival, but now like a war wolf, he turned into one of the most uh, bloodthirsty hard hardliners, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the person who threatens Ukraine and the whole world um, uh, with the language of, of a gangster. And um, 
unexpectedly it works. Uh, it's it's clear that during the last uh, two years, Medvedev uh, um, had a tremendous comeback as a politician because uh, um, four years ago, when he was uh, replaced with Mikhail Mishustin as the head of Russian government, it seemed like uh, Medvedev's uh, political career was over. But now he he's uh, rather influential again. He is uh, in charge of um, organizing uh, um, most important meetings. He uh, he he has direct access to the body. Probably he he he's one of top three uh, Russian top bureaucrats to to meet Putin on a regular basis, uh, which which makes him uh, um, um, still very important. Uh, um, politician or top bureaucrat. Um, I need to, um, to mention that uh, the largest clan uh, in the Russian government, uh, so-called systemic li liberals, are still there. Uh, for many years, they, they have been very important and uh, they, um, they held most of the um, positions in the government in charge of the economy. And probably they, they are still going to be there uh, after the um, new government is appointed and uh, uh, people like finance minister uh, Anton Silvanov or held head of central bank Vera Nabiulina uh, are considered to be very loyal and very effective managers. And uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter that uh, they are known uh, to be not really uh, ardent supporters of the war. Still, they they proved with the with the complete silence and with the. Uh, with no uh, uh, attempts of uh, uh, expressing any uh, any kind of opposition to, to the war, uh, that they, they are super loyal, and um, that that's that's why they they have uh, they 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 are still uh, trusted by by Vladimir Putin. Um, it's important that there is uh, some kind of new face uh, in that uh, clan of uh, systemic liberals, and probably uh, the new potential uh, leader of uh, of that clan. Uh, which is Roman Abramovich, uh, uh, who was um, considered to be the most influential businessman for for many years, but now uh, is much more uh, of uh, unofficial uh, foreign minister of Russia because he is uh, the the person who is really trusted by uh, by Vladimir Putin. At the same time, uh, he uh, has become the most active supporter of. Uh, all kinds of negotiations between Russia and the West, Russia and Ukraine. Um, he is probably the most important mediator uh, as it was in the beginning of the war, and he still plays the same role uh, discussing the exchange of prisoners of war or in negotiating uh, the return of children taken, um, taken from Ukraine. So uh, that's, uh, that's, I think, that's um, um, uh, all the most important points from um, from my report, uh, I would love to um, to conclude that with with um, um, re repeating the same important trend that yes, we we see the obvious uh, radicalization of uh, Russian pol political system. Uh, although a lot of people do not believe in that new ideology that that Russia has to wage a, a holy jihad against the war uh, against the world. Uh, that there is a clash of civilizations between uh, Russia and the West. Most bureaucrats understand that that's just uh, that's just propaganda, but some others uh, really start start believing in that, and it's a bit hard for them to abandon their previous way way of life, the traditional cynical, corrupt hedonism they they used to enjoy. But uh, the the way. Um, that's the way of uh, the current Russian pol political system. They um, they have to change, to slowly change their lifestyle and uh, the way they talk. It's uh, still far from transforming R Russia uh, um, to some kind of Orthodox Christian Iran. Uh, but um, unfortunately, that's the direction uh, they have taken. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Uh, well done on the paper and congratulations again. Uh, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought and a lot to dig into uh, in this discussion. Um, for those of, uh, those of you joining us online, thank you for being here. And if you want to find the report that Mikhail so eloquently described, you can find that on the event 
registration page and we'll also have um, a link in the Zoom chat for those of you joining via Zoom. Uh, I want to introduce the rest of our panel here. Um, and, and first, I, sh I should mention that uh, we're delighted to have Mikhail here at the Atlantic Council. He's actually the newest non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Um, and he's already put together this phenomenal report for us. So, so well done, Mikhail, and, and thank you again. Um, next up, we have Natalia Arnaud, who's president and founder of the Free Russia Foundation. And then we have Maria Snegovaya, senior fellow with the Russia, sorry, Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, thank you all for being here. Natalia, I wanna start with you. Uh, simple question off the top. I just want your first reaction to Mikhail's presentation. What stuck out uh, the most to you about the report? Thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this interesting event, very timely, and uh, thanks to Mikhail for another excellent uh, work, uh, though I have to confess I'm still in the process of reading and already enjoying uh, the style and uh, all the information, and it was interesting to listen to his summary of the report. Um, well, probably the most interesting here was uh, to hear some new names like uh, Roman Abramovich, and yes, we of course all um, Mm, so his uh, activization lately and as a mediator, as a negotiator uh, between Russia and the West, uh, it's very interesting. Um, another thing I should know that, uh, again, I have much more expertise on Russian civil society, pro-democracy movement and independent media than Russian elites. And uh, what I can say about Russian elites is that they are probably the most opportunistic, the most covert, the most, uh, I don't know, um, valueless. And so, um, I don't know... Uh, Probably uh, this, um, besides of the, all these usual suspects uh, that uh, Mikhail um, enumerated, uh, it's interesting to see what uh, what is next, uh, like second or next tire of uh, people uh, that is in the Kremlin's uh, cards play, and um, especially in the regions, if they are even uh, having any uh, I don't know, discussion or again understanding how paranoid Putin is about anybody who. Uh, closely, remotely popular, or could um, I don't know um, discredit him somehow? I I can imagine about uh, again all these um, people. Uh, what is interesting is um, also is about the role of the Orthodox Church. Uh, we know it was always a prolongation of the uh, political system in the Soviet Union and in Russia. And I don't know how deeply. Um, impact how what a deep impact they have on the society and knowing that numbers some numbers like one percent of people are truly religious truly going to like again churches and all that it's more again quite a surface quite a Potemkin village like everything in Russia <laughs> and um, uh, or again uh, these so-called Russian liberals uh, like in the US Rhino and Dino it's a liberals in name only <laughs> um, and of course I don't know how um, serious is to discuss uh, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, who is most probably, again, as I can judge, uh, is being used by Putin as a contrast that, uh, to the West, like, see, uh, he's, there are much more radical people than me. Uh, so, but generally, yes, very interesting, of course, uh, we understand that um, mm, the changes in Russia won't happen uh, only uh, with a split of elites or only with um, uh, people's uh, protest and things like that. It should be the combination of everything plus a huge uh, international pressure and uh, the true uh, democratization in Russia won't happen um, with only one part. Again, only if elites decide to reform somehow, it should be like, again, very genuine and big uh, and broader uh, support from people from below. Uh, we remember Yeltsin, uh, what, 19... 87, when he had to plea for uh, rehabilitation, uh, when he was very weak, and when several years later he was supported by so many people, how different he became, or uh, when there was a coup in uh, 1991, how again all these putschists, how they behaved, and uh, when they saw the again the people's reaction, how like very scary and <laughs> scared they became. So um, what we I see my role in, and people uh, in organizations like mine is to uh, make sure that uh, there is a bigger representation of people of grassroots that uh, when, whenever there is an opportunity for changes and we believe in them 
um, that there is a genuine people support uh, to make this uh, reform sustainable and um, only democratization in Russia is a, again is a sustainability of Ukraine's victory and the guarantee of sustainability and the key factor in stability and security in the entire region globally. And uh, it's, of course, I understand skepticism about um, prospects of democratization in Russia by many experts by many governments and so on. But we as pro-democracy Russians just cannot afford not to believe in that. We have to have this picture uh, of the beautiful Russia of the future and make sure and work every day to, to try to achieve it. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Uh, well, I think we'll get to, to more of some of what you talked about further in the discussion. Uh, Maria, you're up next. Your main takeaway from the report. Yeah, thank you so much, Mikhail, and the Atlantic Council honor to be here and uh, reconnect with my uh, colleagues. Uh, now, um, I think it's a very important uh, endeavor to try to analyze the elites, and I certainly appraise Mikhail for having started this effort, and I'm actually surprised that, Mikhail, you were, as you say, you were able to find people to talk to still, because most of my investigative journalists are in a very bad friends, colleagues who I talk to are in a very bad situation now saying that everybody in Russia, the Kremlin in particular, has been afraid, uh, stopped entirely talking to them since the start of the war. Uh, I wanted to flag several uh, trends that we observe in the elites over the times, and also maybe some of the points of possible uh, disagreements with Mikhail based on my own uh, academic work on the elites. Uh, first of all, uh, some of the trends that we've discovered uh, within the elite since the start of the war, which I think deserve a little bit more attention, perhaps, Mikhail, as you work on huge extension of the paper. While it's very important to uh, flag the presence of particular um, elites, particular names uh, who have uh, special uh, influence, uh, the trends that we see are also obviously uh, quite important. And one, one of them is the fact that despite this radical breakaway uh, with the West uh, that the um, uh, Kremlin accomplished on uh, February 2022. And despite the consequences that this so-called allegedly kleptocratic elite also suffered, right? We used to tell, speak of these people as uh, somebody who vacation in Côte d'Azur and has, has their kids studying in top European and American schools. Somehow, uh, despite all this cost and radical changes in the lifestyles as a result of the sanctions that followed, we have not seen uh, too many elite splits. In fact, literally, uh, we've seen a couple of system liberals slowly moving away, including Ale Alexei Kudrin, uh, Anatoly uh, Chubais, and perhaps a couple more, but nothing else. And it would be really interesting to understand and try to make sense of why not, and especially to what extent the individual sanctions are then uh, really uh, a, a working tool uh, to try and target them. Uh, second, and I think um, Mikhail points at this topic when he talks, for example, about Patricia, the greater replacement of the old elite groups with their descendants, uh, it's, it was, becomes an inherited type of monarchy, inherited aristocracy, where slowly but gradually uh, top elites um, sons and daughters of the elite members, they are appointed in the positions of power. I think this is another trend that is extremely important to trace. Uh, Putin is not getting any younger. His closest associates are not getting any younger. The average age is actually the oldest across all of the post-Soviet space, which, by the way, itself, I think, uh, is an achievement. And they are right now um, actively uh, interested in replacing and re- um, is reinstituting, continuing the system. So unfortunately, it does not look like this is all going to be over uh, with Putin at all. Uh, so this trend, I think, would have deserved better analysis and more focus in the report. Perhaps Mikhail, you can take um, another, as you take that and keep that in mind as you continue, continue working on this topic. Last but not the least, there's a lot of talk about a literary shuffling now. Now, I think Mikhail Putin very well. Uh, it understands uh, and agrees with you on some of the conclusions in this report that many of the elites kind of were caught off guard. Uh, and he um, is now talking about the uh, replacement of the elites with more patriotic, committed uh, Russian leaders, especially those with experience in the so-called special military operation. In fact, um, based on my sources, this participation in uh, the war in Ukraine is now uh, interpreted as a career lift for many of the Russian elite members, because this is something that will be very beneficial um, 
if they have it on their uh, resume in the future. So that's certainly a completely upside down reality uh, for Russia, but nonetheless, again, something that's worth uh, looking at. And uh, my key point uh, that I wanted to uh, finish with is that uh, where I disagree with Mikhail is actually on the degree of non-ideological nature of these elites. Uh, the report concludes by stating that almost no one uh, believes in the values that Putin and Kovalchuk are trying to uh, spread. Accordingly, not uh, not Kirienko's young technocrats, not FSB officers, not working liberals. Accordingly, uh, it will be hard for Putin and Kovalchuk to create this uh, hybrid monster of Orthodox Christian and Iran-style uh, theocracy. I do not uh, fully subscribe to that uh, conclusion. For, first of all, for the reasons that I just flagged, uh, Putin is actually actively working on establishing, on uh, uh, infusing uh, the cre these existing elites with new commerce, with potentially more ideological takes on that. And by the way, why uh, the experience in the military operation will be important is, quote unquote, special military operation. Uh, that's because it kind of locks in these people in a particular type of worldview. In for the West, this will be, no matter what, a horrible, uh, almost genocidal, bloody war. And all people who participated in that one way or another will be uh, understood as war criminals. Accordingly, when you infuse the elites with people of that kind, they have no way to go back. Right now, they're stuck uh, with that inheritance, and they will have one way or another to continue Putin's policies. They can, for example, pay agree on reparations to uh, Ukraine or participate in certain serious negotiations, uh, given that they have now the starting background from the, in the eyes of the West. But more importantly, my own analysis shows that uh, Putin's elites top 100 most influential people in Putin's elite, for example, is really this weird hybrid of left over Soviet elites with the background of the Soviet nomenclature. I think that it's the closest to Kirienko's technocrats. Some of them are younger, but many are also descendants of uh, uh, their fathers and mothers who uh, used to belong to the Soviet nomenclature. We can't really talk of any uh, radical elite rotation, at least in the 1990s. Uh, really, the system, and to a large extent, inherited the top, um, Yeltsin, uh, the top Soviet elites. Uh, having said that, where the change came is, the, uh, is that it kind of switched around. Uh, during the Soviet times, nomenclature, the KPSS, the, the Communist Party, controlled the KGB. What changed under Putin is that now KGB control, controls nomenclature. According to our estimates, uh, nomenclature descendants right now still constitute about 50-60% of uh, Putin elites, and so the key are about 30%. And uh, I don't think that we can talk of these people as being non-ideological. In fact, they're quite, um, especially the KGB, uh, since the start, they are quite brainwashed into their position of the West, and they view the world in a very particular way that is unfortunately congruent with what Putin is right now Maria, doing. Maria, I think, I think uh, you've given here. us a, a lot yet yeah, to, to think about there as well. I want to give Mikhail a couple minutes to just respond there and then get into the rest of the discussion. Mikhail? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Natalia and, and, and to Maria for your for your comments. Um, uh, I would start with with the last point highlighted by uh, by Maria. Um, uh, actually, that's that's what that's what I've written. Uh, I do think that um, uh, that's the process, uh, but we are just in the beginning of this process. Uh, yes, definitely, we have heard promises made by Vladimir Putin that that he he's going to promote uh new people uh, people with the, the experience of participation in, in the war with veterans of uh, special military operation uh and to uh, to to promote them to the the um, Kremlin's hierarchy to the government to the elite uh we haven't seen that so far so so yes probably that that's going to happen after the the presidential election but uh that process hasn't started yet. Uh, we are expecting that change. Uh, uh, so I don't think that that is fair to um, uh, to speak about uh, that transformation as uh, of something that, that has already happened. Uh, but but yes, obviously that's uh, that's very logical trend. And uh, and yes, uh, uh, the the so-called Kiryankis uh, nomenclature um, is very effective, but it's a bit outdated because. Um, their uh, their loyalty is is unquestioned, but they are uh, they or at least some of them do not share a lot of uh, uh, those wartime 
um, values and wartime level of uh, pat patriotism needed. Uh, it, um, if we, sp we speak about the, the split of the elite, I think that, that's a very important question. And uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it needs to be addressed because uh, unfortunately, I, I think that the West has lost the opportunity to, to divide Russian elites. Because right in the beginning, we we saw the potential for uh, for that um, uh, he, uh, huge split in the elites. We we saw that uh, a lot of people, especially big business, uh, were in panic. We uh, we have seen a lot of uh, proofs for for that because um, um, many of us have heard uh, the, um, the the taped conversations uh, between several Russian oligarchs. Uh, for for example, for Hadeh um or um, I forgot the name of the other one. Um, sorry, but uh, there were two ve very very important and very scandalous. Con uh, uh, um, Ahmedov was speaking with uh, with the was Prigozhin, and uh, the, the 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 second conversation was the um, the ship's uh, oligarch uh, uh, who used to be close to uh, to to Igor Sechin, uh, uh, Maria, do you remember his, his name? Um, sorry, probably Maurice. some. some, some yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in so, thirty seconds here, and then we'll, we'll move on. No, it's impossible. Uh, give, give, <laughs> give, give me two minutes. Sure, give sure. me two minutes. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't. Uh, we we obviously saw that that a lot of uh, people from the elite, especially from the business elite, were really scared by uh, by the beginning of the war, and they thought that uh, that that was a fatal mistake of Vladimir Putin, and uh, um, he would not be able to get away with it. Uh, and now we see the dramatic change of their of their perception. Uh, now we see that uh, they think that he's winning. Now, now we see that uh, they think that the situation uh, is, sta is stabilized. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of all those people who were going to leave Russia, who were uh, willing to go to the West, who or who were willing to stay in the West, uh, they were in a way pushed back to Russia. The the, the key example is uh, is Michael Friedman. Uh, the, the the oligarch who was uh, staying uh, in London for for a year and a half after uh, the beginning of the war, and now he symbolically came, came back to Russia, uh, and uh, and now he he he's in Moscow, and actually he is he's unpunished by uh, by Vladimir Putin. Um, at the same time, he he symbolizes uh, that perception of of Russian elite that that no one who wanted to flee, no one who wanted uh, to escape uh, uh, Putin's system, Putin's regime, was welcomed in the West. But uh, on the contrary, uh, the, there is no way back. There, there is no other way except for come back to Moscow and to, uh, to pledge loyalty to Vladimir Putin. And I think that's, uh, that's um, a disturbing point. Thanks, Mikhail. Yeah, lots, lots to discuss here. Uh, it's just such a, a rich topic. Um, I want to remind our audience that you're watching uh, All the Autocrats Men, the court politics of Putin's inner circle here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we have Mikhail Zigar, the author of this report that we're launching today, uh, Natalia Arno of the Free Russia Foundation, and Maria Snegovaya of CSIS. I want to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to askac.org. That's askac.org. And I will pitch them to panelists in the last section of the event here. Um, Natalia, back to you. You're an experienced advocate uh, for, for a democratic Russia. We're talking about court politics in the Kremlin. How does, how do these, you know, very inside baseball, intricate relationships affect life for ordinary Russians? Thank you. Well, first of all, I would disagree about uh, the elites being too ideological. Um, I think, again, they the most covert, the most um, opportunistic. And uh, as we say it in Russia, they would change their shoes <laughs> the first minute the situation changes. Uh, and we saw it throughout the history so many times. Um, probably the most ideological would be this decision-making agency, uh, the National Security Council, but it's also the oldest, uh, again, the oldest um, uh, entity yeah, in, in Russian politics. Um, we can uh, judge by the uh, 
changes, how, how fast they can change uh, by many things, by many poles, by many behavioral patterns. But uh, like one research comes to mind immediately is um, a 27 year research by the professor of Michigan University, um, William Zimmerman, who did the study of Russian elites. Uh, and uh, one of the numbers, I think the last um, wave of his research was in 2020. Uh, and back then uh, only 46% uh, of Russian elites supported uh, the use of the army, for example. So less than a half or um from uh, throughout all this study um like um, in um, 1995 uh, 65 percent of russian elite were saying that ukraine should be uh, the part of russia uh, and uh, by 2020 it was only five percent uh, of russian elite uh, which means that uh, they by that time they agreed that ukraine is an independent and sovereign country and so many other polls uh, showing just like even in like in the beginning of february of 2022 about the uh, full-scale invasion and uh um, how surprised uh, a lot of Russians, including this uh, infamous um, um, gathering of uh, Putin, uh, scolding Narishkin, for example. Uh, so I wouldn't say that they're too ideological, they're very uh, opportunistic. Uh, as for the um, impact, well, first of all, it's uh, we, we should understand that it's a military dictatorship at the moment, and uh, the Kremlin controls uh, everything in Russia. It uh, controls all the flows of information, uh, media, uh, many uh, social media. It has a um, monopoly on violence. Uh, it uh, has uh, vast resources to increase, uh, keep increasing propaganda and uh, repressions. Um, so um, the fight of uh, pro-democracy Russians and um, both uh, inside the country and um, in exile and uh, of the Russian civil society in general, it's uh, not it's happening not on equal terms with the Kremlin, I would say, and uh, like we can take this so-called uh, elections uh, and uh, the position, for example, has uh, basically two scenarios, two two options how to act either to boycott uh, this uh, ceremony uh, or um, to still be some kind of a political subject, political actor, and uh, try to still to talk to people there are so little channels of communication with russian people and usually they are very apolitical and this is probably the biggest party in russia not the ruling party united russia but the passive russia party uh, and uh, the elections uh, they are probably the very few ways how to still uh, talk to people and to show the difference between as uh, we saw in the in Putin's direct line, there's a difference between uh, the reality and what they're being told on the television. Um, so what is happening in the Kremlin, of course, they control all the narratives, all the all the situation in the country. It's very difficult to... to they, they create the agenda, and uh, probably Alexei Navalny was one of uh, the strongest, at least, uh, the strongest actors that could uh, change the agenda, could... Uh, come up with his own agenda. A lot of things that he did was quite innovational and the Kremlin had to uh, respond, um, including like all his uh, anti-corruption initiatives that became so trendy and um, uh, on a very expert and interesting level for people, engaging many people, or his um, strategies for voting, all this, um, let's uh, vote for any party, but not for the party of uh, crooks and thieves that he did in 2011, 2012, for this smart voting, or uh, how he was able to create this media machine, uh, basically uh, challenging the official media, or even like when he talked to his the, 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 of the member of this assassination squad that basically like nearly... Uh, um poisoned him like uh, to death uh, the first time and uh, it was quite uh, quite innovative but there are also other ways that can uh, mm, mm, surprise the kremlin when they had to be responsive uh, mm. uh, for example this um when the exiled russians became a force <laughs> uh, because again the strategy of the kremlin for many years what was to force us out and just so that we are not engaged into Russian politics and we don't have any influence, but I think right now we see that uh, exiled Russian civil society, media and everything, they're becoming stronger, they're becoming a real political force impacting the situation inside the country and collectively they have at least 30 million um, outreach inside the country and they could reach much more if not the 
self-imposed sanctions of big tech when it's almost impossible to do any targeting inside the country. And I think we see it uh, in the, uh, we are talking about three measures uh, for like since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, it's uh, um, closing uh, borders and uh, closing down YouTube and the Russian authorities are not doing it. Uh, and possibly this is uh, how, again, all this, um, we collectively were able to uh, influence the public opinion and the Kremlin understands that it's not possible. And uh, after the first uh, wave of mobilization, they badly need, the Russian authorities badly need the second wave of mobilization, but they are not doing it also understanding how, uh, what an unpopular measure it's going to be. Um, Thanks, again, Natalia. I, I want to get one more question into to Mikhail and Maria before we, we move to the audience. Um, Maria, this next one's for you. Um, so we had the presidential election just last week, uh, and Putin, you know, the, the Kremlin reported that Putin secured 88% of the vote. And I know you follow Russian public opinion super closely. How close or far off from reality is that 88% figure? Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately, there's few ways to tell uh, for sure, uh, since uh, there's questions about uh, well, reliable polls and um, um, are, and there's a lot of variation, honestly, there's a huge gap in how many various observers estimate the size of the electoral fraud. But we can that say that uh, approximately, it, uh, we can at least speak of probably 70-75% uh, support is some, somewhat of an average number. Most importantly, and I wanted to bring this back uh, to the Elise conversation, it really doesn't matter at this point. Unfortunately, we lost the moment when the public uh, had any opportunity to influence anything uh, within Russia. And and this is where I think the elites and Rush and ordinary Russians are no different. They have, the society has shown extreme tendency to be very complacent with no matter what horrible things Putin does. In that sense, the actual numbers of dissent that they're still there, that really do not matter because uh, there's absolutely zero ability to influence anything that uh, Putin does. Uh, more than that, and this is where I want to bring back uh, the discussion of ideology. ideology. In our analysis, uh, we show that uh, Russians, it was large enough sizable share, actually are quite ideologically brainwashed and imperialistic in their preferences. So they actually support uh, at least like maybe 40% of the um, um, a given sample, they would support an aggression against uh, neighboring countries of Russia, uh, and that makes it actually very hard for Putin to back down. This brings me back to the discussion of the elites. Siloviki cannot be really uh, looked at as non-ideological groups. They are deeply brainwashed in anti-Westernism and imperialist ideas, uh, because many of these people in power today, they were socialized at the peak of the Cold War, uh, and the Brezhnev and Andropov. And these people certainly, unfortunately, will keep doing what they're doing. Uh, they have not no desire to break away from Putin, partly because they are uh, quite uh, aligned. Their preferences are quite aligned with what Putin is doing. To the extent there are some disagreements, they are stemming from, mostly from the oligarchs and the like, conversations that Mikhail has referenced, including, I think, Roman Dracenko with Nikolai Matyshevsky, probably the second one. Uh, they, sh they have shown that they have absolutely no agency at all. So I think we should, at this point, perhaps drop uh, the, as it comes, uh, shows now, uh, looks now, naive illusions of our ability to influence what is happening inside of Russia. And the front line of the fight today is in Ukraine. Only help Ukraine will be able to contain Putin at this point, not society and not the elites. Perfect. Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, Mikhail, last of my questions is, is for you. Um, I got to ask about Medvedev, Dmitry Medvedev. Um, who I think is a, a prominent figure in, in your paper. And you write that that his change from this, you know, uh, almost seeming like a, a liberal during his presidency to now this really hardline um, figure just spewing vitriol primarily on, on this unhinged telegram channel of his um, is, is actually a plan of his and, and that he's not looking at the prime ministership, but possibly at the presidency. Can you explain your argument there for our audience? You're on mute right now, but if you unmute. I'm sorry. Um, thank you for your question. And thank, and thank you, Maria, for reminding the, the name Roman Trotsenko. Yeah, I, I, I was speaking about him. Uh, you know, yeah, it, that's that's quite an anecdotic, uh, or at least it used to be considered an, an anecdotic figure uh, for, for, uh, for several years. And um, as we know, uh, 
after um, Alexei Navalny start, started that, uh, the uh, Medvedev's nickname was uh, Pathetic, and that uh, he, he, he was known by that name for the, the Russian internet. Um, and obviously he was he was very humiliated by uh, by those people uh, whose trust he was expected um, he was expecting and, and wh whose love he was he was expecting because he he can he considered himself to be the the leader of the the democratic Russia but on the contrary uh, all the liberals all the all all Russia's middle class uh, did not buy that, uh, and uh, he has never been uh, close to being uh, as popular as as Alexei Navalny or any other uh, real uh, de democratic leader. So, so partially, uh, that's the the result of that psychological transformation of of Dmitry Medvedev. But partially, as as uh, people who used to be close to him uh, claim, uh, that's a very pragmatic um, pragmatic step because. Uh, um, uh, during the first weeks of the war, he uh, he had that uh, that conversation with with Vladimir Putin, and, and Vladimir Putin hinted uh, that uh, that there there is still room for him to to grow, and there is an opportunity to come back as the the influential politician. He needs to be popular, to po to be popular like uh, late Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Uh, so um, so that's the role model uh, Dmitry Medvedev chose, and it's it's very clear. That that he's trying to be very um, very aggressive and very hostile, and he's trying to be as rude as possible. Um, so sometimes uh, all those uh, texts uh, we're reading are not uh, are not written by by himself, but some sometimes he he does that um, uh, with with his own handwriting. Uh, but yes, he he managed to to, to transform his, his image into uh the gangster like uh it doesn't it doesn't mean that that he's taken seriously by uh by 100 of bureaucracy but we see that that he is uh he is sometimes quoted by uh um, by even ardent uh uh hardliners like uh Zahar Prilepin, who uh who started writing about medvedev um uh with a kind of admiration uh so so yes it's uh it, it doesn't mean that uh, that Medvedev has the real uh, political potential, but it's a very clear sign that that pretending to be super patriotic and pretending to be um, to be uh, super anti-Western is is enough, and that's and that's the uh, the way uh, how how Russian bureaucrats think they they should behave. Definitely, we uh, we we had uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of argument here between uh, Marie and Natalia and me. If uh, Russian bureaucrats are sincere in their um, hatred towards towards the West, and obviously uh, all of us are right, and uh, uh, Mar Marie is clearly right when she says that that Siloviki, that all those uh, uh, veterans of um, KGB or um, or uh, Ministry of, of Defense. A lot of people who are serving in uh, in different positions uh, and uh, have that um, security services background. They are true believers. Yes, they were raised uh, in that paradigm that uh, if, in a Cold War paradigm. And uh, old Cold Warriors uh, still believe that America is the enemy, as well as uh, people in America with with Soviet with with Cold War background know for sure that that Russia will always be an enemy, uh, and it's it, it's it's very clear. Uh, the younger generation is is slightly different, and I think it's very important uh, to to understand that the generation gap in Russia is huge, and according to to the old sociology. Uh, we see that that the people from the Soviet generation are rather different from from the, the from the the people um, born and raised uh, in in prehistoric years or after the collapse of Soviet Union. Just just a quick example, uh, according to to Levada um, statistics, uh, people older than uh, than fifty five years uh, think that. Uh, LGBT people should be killed. Like uh, more more than than uh, sixty five percent of of those uh, answer that that uh, they have no right to leave. But uh, if uh, if we see the same um, the same question uh, answered by by people uh, younger than 
than 35. Uh, the same 65% think that uh, they they uh, should be granted the um, full um, civil rights and uh, there should be same-sex marriage legalized in Russia. So uh, the same percentage, but uh, quite the opposite uh, uh, approach. And I think th that that's important, and that's uh, and that 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 is understood by by Putin's um, ideological team, and that's. Uh, one of the reasons for the current radicalization of the rhetorics of the ideology of the propaganda they know that they have to do something with with the younger generation which is uh more liberal and more open-minded and more westernized and they need to drag it back they, they 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 need to make all those people uh scared they need to take them mentally back to soviet gulag perfect thanks mikhail um we have nine minutes left in this event, and we're going to go to the audience. I'm going to ask our panelists to give 60 second answers to these questions because we have a lot of them. I know you guys can do this. Uh, number one, we're going to go to Maria. Um, this is an anonymous question. It says, do you see the Russian system as stable or can the, the radicalism that I think Mikhail describes, uh, can this radicalism in power assisted by loyal technocrats continue indefinitely? 60 seconds, it's all you Indefinitely is a very long period of time in the long term role of dead, as Keynes told us. But at the moment, I think, yes, uh, uh, the system has been stabilized for a combination of repressions, uh, very active ideological brainwashing, reshuffling of the elites and the exodus of liberal minded groups. Uh, so I think uh, we, and also this 87% is very symbolic, uh, the number that Putin drew himself in the last election, um, shows, uh, is meant to showcase the symbolic unity. For us, for policymaking purposes, what it means is that unfortunately, there is no enough resistance within the Russian society or the elites to create a any obstacles to what Putin is doing, and uh, the West is failing to contain Russia as we speak. So we should try better imposing the sanctions, creating issues for the Kremlin, for the Putin regime, uh, to sustain this loyalty using uh, the energy revenues. Super. A plus for you. Uh, Mikhail, next question. Um, this comes from reporter Michael Wasira. He says, uh, Peter Pomerantsev uh, recently published a book arguing that one way of exposing extreme authoritarian propaganda is to consciously produce even more extreme propaganda in order to highlight the absurdity of what the regime is saying. Uh, he's wondering if that sounds similar to what Medvedev might be doing. Your thoughts? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's... For, actually, for me, it's hard to speak seriously about what Medvedev says, and I I don't think that really a lot of people take take him seriously. He is not uh, he is the um, the pathet pathetic ver version of pro Russian propaganda. There are a, uh, a lot of more dangerous people who are sincerely um, spreading that 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 kind of hate speech and hate ideology in Russia, and they are much more dangerous. And I, I don't think that that to confront uh, the, their rhetorics, uh, Russian media in exile sh should use the same propagandist tools, because I think uh, that, that values are, are that values should be important for 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 those Russians who fight against the regime. And uh, actually, Alexei Navalny was the, the great example of, of a politician who sincerely believed in democratic values. And his legacy is uh, that uh, democratic values matter. And that's important for a lot of Russians, that he gave his life for the democratic values. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Natalia, question for you. This is an anonymous one as well. Um, how do the Russian people see the Kremlin's program of assassinations and violence against elites and dissidents? What do they? What does the Russian people think about that in general? Well, difficult to tell about everybody, but I, I don't think that Russian people like violence and uh, um, like everything. Um, and I think it was a very big mistake of uh, the Kremlin to. Uh, assassinate Alexei Navalny like this. Uh, you can uh, murder a person only once, uh, but uh, they by this murder they made him a martyr. They they made his uh, idea, his concept of the beautiful Russia of the future even more appealing for many people. And many those who were already demoralized or tired uh, had this fatigue because of this. Uh, the war is going too long. 
Uh, now a lot of us are even more mobilized, even uh, angry and uh, ready to and have this bigger responsibility to double down our efforts to continue our fight. Uh, we see that the protest and the resistance didn't disappear. Uh, the um, visibility of it is uh, is less, and people are, especially inside Russia, they are trying all the possible ways to survive, and uh, they are. Um, they not, don't show everything, but as soon as there is, a, is even a small window of opportunity to express uh, what they believe in, immediately we see, uh, like, for example, support for uh, Ekaterina Dunsova or long lines for Boris Nadezhdin or long lines uh, to this funeral when even bringing uh, flowers was criminalized or these huge lines uh, on the, this last uh, wish of Alexei Navalny to join the uh, noon against Putin on uh, uh, last Sunday. And so... Um, I think it's uh, still coming. We should believe in, in changes. We are doing a lot of things by becoming stronger. We also learn how to coordinate our efforts more and better. And I think it's um, just uh, don't give up what Navalny was saying. And we are not going to give up. And we need support. And we need to. Uh, it's it's possible uh, this, to reach this good scenario to have Russia free and democratic. But we all should believe in it, and we should do something, not only be negative about everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Mikhail, one more to you. This comes from Stephen Fisher. He's asking specifically about uh, something you have in your report. He says, you write that officials um, in the Kremlin speak about a holy war and keeping the country on a war footing. So it seems that the Russian state can no longer be built on this on cynical, corrupt hedonism. Do you think that that corruption has taken kind of a become a secondary um, issue? Is, is the war the thing right now? No, I don't think that it's, it's secondary, and I I think that for many for ma many Russian bureaucrats, including for those people who work for the Ministry of Defense, for example, uh, the understanding that their their key priority is to enrich themselves is still there. Everyone knows that that that's the possibility if you reach some some certain de degree of. Uh, um, uh, if, if if you reach some 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 high position in in the government, that's the possibility to uh, to have a better life, and uh, that's everything uh, people want. And um, uh, Mar Maria um, said that for for many people to participate in the war, to to go to the front line, that's some some kind of social uh, uh, elevator, and they 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 want to have it. That's that's the reason why they they do it. But at the, at the same time, it's uh, it's very funny, I guess, that not funny, but uh, it's um, surprising that this war uh, from the Russian side doesn't have any heroes. It's not allowed to to name anyone who is um, who is fighting. We don't know the names of uh, uh, generals or officers or soldiers who are alive. The last and the only hero was Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, it, and it's clear that that was a mistake. And um, so it's it's very weird social elevator if uh, uh, if you cannot reach uh, glory the only way you you should enrich yourself. Thanks very much. Yeah, very interesting. There's no Stakhanovites in this war, huh? Um, anyway, I think we're going to call that time. Uh, thank you to our excellent panelists, Mikhail Zigar. Uh, Natalia Arnaud and Maria Snagovaya for joining us and for, for not only sharing their time, but also their expertise with us and with our audience today. Um, again, please be sure to check out Mikhail's uh, report on the Atlantic Council website, All the Autocrats Men, the Court Politics of Putin's Inner Circle. This is the latest installment in the Atlantic Council's Russia Tomorrow series. Check out the series as well. We'll have more um, coming in the, the next few months here, more interesting discussions about what's going on in Russia today and what's going to possibly happen in the future. So again, thank you all, um, and we'll be doing more on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can subscribe to my subscribe.